Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to read from this morning. And we're going to read from verse 15. Let's just pray first of all. Lord, we come to your word in no way relying on ourselves, Lord. We've just uh, thought about how we are uh, not to be proud, Lord, uh, and how uh, really you humbled yourself uh, to come to this earth, Lord, and, and how can we hold any pride within us. So, Lord, we don't hold any self-confidence as we come to your word. Lord, we pray that you would deliver all of us, speaker and hearer alike, from thinking we understand things, Lord, when actually we need your revelation afresh. Lord, we pray that you would not just reveal things to us, but enthuse us, Lord, that you would stir our hearts in one way or another as we look at your word and look at you. Lord, we pray, may we not go unmoved this morning, Lord, but move our hearts in the way you want us to, we pray. Lord, we appeal to you, Lord, please let us leave in some way changed and touched by what we've considered, we ask. And please give us understanding of things that are really beyond our understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And we're going to include in the passage this morning, if you just flick over to chapter 2 and verses 9 to 10, where it says something similar. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Praise the Lord. Well, last time in uh, Colossians, we were looking at the previous verses of verses 9 to 12 and reminded that the prayer for the Colossians was that they would come to have a knowledge of the Lord's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding and flowing from that, that they would walk in a worthy manner in their daily life, pleasing the Lord in everything, bearing fruit in all kinds of different good works, growing to know the Lord more. Uh, being strengthened with power and ultimately being steadfast and patient in their walk with the Lord and giving thanks to the Father. That was what we considered last time. Uh, we are going to do verses 13 and 14 next time, along with other verses that tell us of the Lord's specific dealings with us. But this morning we come to look at the Lord's overall plan of what the Father uh, has planned for the world and for his son, uh, and of how the son um, really comes to have first place in everything. So we're looking really this morning at the centrality of Christ uh, in the whole of the Lord's plan. And this passage tells us four things about the Lord Jesus that we're going to consider this morning, and then we'll finish briefly with a couple of applications for us. What it means for us, as we look at the Lord Jesus, what does this mean for us? The first thing our passage tells us is that the Lord Jesus is fully God in bodily form. He is fully God in bodily form. He describes God as invisible. And Job takes up something of this matter in Job chapter uh, 9. I'm saying it's Job. I didn't actually check to see who was speaking at this point. But in Job chapter 9 and verse 9, it describes God who makes the, the bear, Orion and Pleiades, <coughs> and the chambers of the south, who does great things unfathomable and wondrous works without number. Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. 
were he to snatch away, who could restrain him? Who could say to him, what are you doing? He gets across this idea that the Lord, God, is everywhere, but we can't see him. We can't feel him. We can't hear his voice audibly, generally. So we have this problem, because the God who made us, we can't see him. And yet, we can see him in the Lord Jesus. One of the disciples, Philip, in John 14, says to the Lord Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Now, that was a good question to ask. It's good to ask, reveal the Father to us. The problem was, Philip hadn't understood that he had already seen the Father. The Lord Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? Philip said, show us the Father. The Lord Jesus says, haven't you come to know me? And then he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So the Lord Jesus is saying, and he says elsewhere as well, he makes clear that he is the revelation of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 and verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Where it says the exact repre representation, it's got the idea in the Greek of an engraving uh, or some kind of stamp on a seal. Now, if you um, get a, a seal and stamp it in a bit of wax that's melted, hopefully it will leave an exact copy of what you've stamped. And if you strike a coin, hopefully, if you've done it rightly, the coin will look like the mould. You probably notice that every single 10p in your wallet looks the same, at least on one side. Uh, it looks the same because everyone is an exact copy. Mm. Unless it's been forged, but hopefully it's not been. I doubt anybody would forge a 10p coin. But everyone is the same. And it's got that idea. One person <coughs> said that the Lord Jesus is a precise reproduction in every respect of the Father. That's not to say he was made after him, as we're going to consider. But simply that they are two of a kind. And the Lord Jesus is therefore the image, the representation of the Father. Now before Christ came, the picture of God was a bit more blurry. If you've ever taken a photo uh, on an old camera, um, or even on, sometimes on a mobile phone, the picture is sometimes a bit blurry, and then you focus it and something starts to come into view. Um, well, that's what Christ did, really. Christ brought God into focus so that we have a clearer image. Now, we do still need to pray for understanding. Later in this letter in Colossians, it talks about treasures being hidden in Christ. And we have to come to know them as we pray. But everything we need to understand the Father has already been given to us. The Lord Jesus brought the Father into focus. For example, in the Old Testament, they already knew God was a God of love. He revealed himself to Moses on the mountain, saying that he is a God of compassion, showing compassion <coughs> to thousands. So they'd already picked up that idea in the Psalms, take up the idea of the love of God. But then the Lord Jesus comes, and he shows such love as we consider that he comes down to earth, and beyond that, that he humbles himself to die, and beyond that, to die on a cross, and beyond that, to carry our sins and bear the punishment of them. Wow, that's a revelation the Old Testament people didn't have. They had glimpses of it, even references to it. But now we have it brought into focus. We see what the love of the Lord really means. Just how far it will go. It went various ways already in the Old Testament, but then we see the depths of it. And it reveals it to us. We knew that God was a God of righteousness in the Old Testament. And yet Christ revealed the extent of that righteousness. He lived that perfect life. He stood firm in the face of temptation. And he was ultimately accepted as a perfect sacrifice for us. The Lord Jesus revealed these things. Now Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and verses 10 to 12... 
about the prophets and how they prophesied things about the future and they didn't really fully understand. They had a glimpse of it and it says that they made careful search and inquiries about what they were prophesying about. Can you imagine? You felt the Lord give you a word and you bring it with boldness and say, thus says the Lord, but inside you're thinking, Lord, what is this all about? I don't fully understand what you're saying. They made careful search, but they didn't understand what you and I understand. We are so privileged. We take it for granted, don't we? Some of us have grown up in Christian families. We've just got used to all these stories about the Lord Jesus. But compared to so many people before his arrival, we have so much to be thankful for that reveals the Father more fully. Now, do you notice it says, it doesn't say he was the image of the invisible God. It doesn't say that for a time he was a bodily representation, but now no longer. It says he is the image. He's not an image only to be seen and grasped by those few people who were privileged to actually see the Lord in the flesh. He's the image for us today. And notice, we read as well, chapter 2 and verse 9, that it says, In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It doesn't say dwelt. It doesn't say that the Lord Jesus was just in a body for a time. It says it dwells in him in bodily form. The invisible God made himself visible in bodily form. The God who fills the universe who in one sense can't really be contained in a body, but he fills the universe, he comes into a body, and then he has stayed in a body, obviously very different from his weak, earthly body. But he is God in bodily form. How gracious and humble it is of the Lord Jesus to do that. He was used to being without any limits, and yet he came down to be frail, Humanity. He came down to be in a body that had to be in one place. And of course a body that was full of weaknesses at that time. But it says he still is in bodily form. It's hard to fully understand. But this is important because it means that one day we will see the Lord Jesus coming in the clouds. The invisible God we will all see revealed. Now there are indications in scripture about something of a body for God the Father. We see various uh, things in the Old Testament and the New, seeing one seated on a throne, uh, as well as references to the Lord's hands <coughs> doing things and his mouth saying things. Um, but we see some indications of God the Father revealed. But certainly in the Son, he is dwelling in bodily form, sat down at the right hand of the Father. And of course, as we seek to see more of Christ and of the Father, we're meant to be changed more into that image. We're not just meant to look at the Lord Jesus and say, ah, isn't that nice? That's what the Lord Jesus is like, and therefore that's what the Father is like. We are meant to be changed. And I say that because in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, it says... We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. We are called to try and behold the glory of the Lord. It is like a mirror right now. We don't see the Lord Jesus in every detail right now. <coughs> but we're called to look at the Word and to pray, and as we uh, commune with the Lord... To behold his glory as in a mirror. And the mirrors in those days weren't necessarily as, uh, as good as our mirrors today. So maybe the reflection was a bit more hazy. And imagine that's what he's talking about. We can only see a certain amount now. But one day we'll see face to face. In the meantime, we're called to be transformed into that same image. As we look at the mirror of the Lord's glory and we see something of his righteousness... We are meant to, with the Lord's help, become more righteous. We see the Lord's love. We've dwelt on it this morning in our worship. 
we should now go out and with the Lord's help have something more of that love within us for others. So the Lord Jesus is fully God in bodily form. Secondly, it says that he created everything for himself and holds it all together. He created everything for himself and holds everything together. It tells us in verse 15 that the Lord Jesus is the firstborn of creation. Firstborn. Now, the firstborn can mean the first one to be born, as the name suggests, or it can mean the first in rank, the first in position. The firstborn, of course, also is the heir, the heir of things, and the Lord Jesus certainly is the heir of all things. The Lord, uh, it says in Psalm 2 and verse 8, the Father says, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. So the Lord Jesus is the heir. He is the firstborn, the one who will inherit all things. But some would say that the firstborn of creation means that he was the first one to be created. The JWs certainly think that. The Mormons and the Muslims also think that the Lord Jesus was a created being. There is another separate word in the Greek for first created, and that word isn't used here. It's the firstborn. It's getting across something different. Sometimes in the Bible, somebody who wasn't born first is made effectively the firstborn. You might think of Jacob. Okay, he kind of made himself the firstborn in some ways, but he uh, took on what was rightfully originally going to be Esau's right as the firstborn. In Psalm 89, we have references to David, the Lord's servant, and then it says in verse 27, I will make him my firstborn. He wasn't the first king of Israel, and he wasn't the firstborn in his own family, and he certainly wasn't the first one to live. But the, but the father says, I will make him my firstborn. Really talking about that position, because it then goes on to say, the highest of the kings of the earth. It's saying, I will make David the first in rank, even though he naturally was a nobody, originally. Now the Lord Jesus, we can see in scripture, is eternal. He was from eternity, like the Father, and he will go on. It's interesting that Jesus is given that title in, uh, in Isaiah 9, Eternal Father. He tells us in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. The same words of God the Father uh, to Moses that reveals that I am, I just exist. I always have, I always will. And Jesus when he says those words, people want to stone him. Because they know what he's saying. They're saying, he's saying, I'm God. I always have existed. You're seeing me in a physical body, but I have always and always will exist. And in Hebrews, it talks about Melchizedek. Uh, depending on how you see it, either the Lord Jesus himself revealing himself or a picture of him. And either way, it tells us that he is described... Uh, in the story of Genesis as having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Mm -hmm. And it relates Melchizedek, therefore, to Jesus. Jesus had no beginning of days. So when it says he's the firstborn of all creation, it's not saying he was the first created. It's saying he is first in rank, <clears throat> first in position. It tells us that by him, or literally in him, all things were created. Later in the same verse, it tells us all things were created through him as well as for him. Now we could see here a picture of God the Father creating through Jesus or in Jesus in some way. We could see a picture of God and his son working together equally in partnership, together creating. I don't think there's much difference between the two of them. The point is, Jesus was fully involved. He is as much creator as God the Father. It tells us at the start of John 1, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. Nothing. So the Lord Jesus is the firstborn of creation, and it tells us that everything that came into being includes thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. I'm not sure we're meant to distinguish hugely between those four, um, but the point is the whole of any kind of power, not just the lowly beings in the world and the lowly animals and the, the plants, but all of the power within and outside the world, both earthly powers and spiritual powers. We think of spiritual powers uh, within our prayer circles as being the evil uh, powers that we see, exam for example, being over geographical areas in the Bible, um, or evil spirits that have power over a particular person. But there's also the good spiritual powers, if I can put it that way, of the angels. The angels that worship the Lord and have stayed faithful to him also have powers given to them by God. But all of this power, good and bad, earthly and spiritual, was created by God, by the Lord Jesus. Now if you just look at Colossians 2 and verse 15, it goes on to point out that God in Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities. Same Greek words as two of those in our passage. Uh, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, through Christ. So the Lord has disarmed these rulers and authorities, but he already had power over them. He already had right over them because he created them. We should remember that the next time we feel that evil is triumphing in our world. The Lord made these powers. He's allowing them their power right now. He can rein it in at any point and he will do one day. Of course, as firstborn, he automatically has dominion over them. The firstborn was raised above his brothers. And the firstborn of creation certainly has power over all that he has created. And as part of being all things, these powers, these thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, it says they were made through him and for him. Everything, whether it's uh, obeying God or in rebellion against him, everything was made for him. You and I were made for the Lord. Now, praise the Lord, because he's shown himself to us, we can try to live for him. But even those that don't acknowledge him were originally made for him. They were intended to worship him and to serve him. That is even true of Satan himself. There's a picture in Ezekiel 28 of the king of Tyre, and it clearly must be going beyond just an earthly king. Uh, many see in that a, a picture of Satan himself, who was once not a fallen angel, but a created angel to worship the Lord, and once served him. And it describes in Ezekiel 28 and verse 14 him as the anointed cherub who covers and it says that you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. It describes him as having the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. There once was a time when every single thing that the Lord created was serving him. And there will come a time when every created thing will acknowledge him as Lord, will bow before him. I'm sure that means, obviously, the spiritual powers, not just the human beings, but everything. Okay, many won't go on to serve him through eternity, but there will come a point when the rest, restored nature of the Lord's all-encompassing kingdom will be there. When once again, all of creation, every created power, every being will say, the Lord Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. And it says that in him all things hold together. 
Now, some would suggest that the Lord kind of, like a watchmaker, set the world in motion and then just let it kind of wind itself down. But here it says, he holds all things together. The verse I read from Hebrews 1 verse 3 carries on to say he upholds all things by the word of his power. The word upholds has the idea of bearing something up, of carrying something. You might think of the words in the Old Testament, underneath are the everlasting arms. The Lord Jesus didn't just set things in motion, he upholds everything. He supports it. If he was to remove that support, you and I and everybody and everything else would cease to exist. But the Lord Jesus upholds us. Doesn't it say somewhere, he holds our very breath in his hand. He could take that away. It's by him holding it that you are breathing now and hopefully awake. He upholds everything. I was picturing the uh, balloon seller, you know, um, you can sort of see the people and they've got all the helium balloons and they're holding them all. Now if they let go, it's, it's scattered. There's no longer that beautiful set of balloons together. The Lord Jesus could let go and we'd all be lost. But praise the Lord, he doesn't let go, he doesn't change, and he upholds everything. And that means in the world, when we see things going to pot, it's not because the Lord has loosened his grip. Of course, he's kind of moved, maybe removed something of his restraint on evil, but he is holding the world. He will only allow what he chooses to, to happen. It means when you hear about climate change, I'm not suggesting we deny it, but it means that when we hear about climate change, we don't need to panic as those without hope, because we know the Lord holds the climate, as with everything else, in the palm of his hand. Only God could do that. And it means we can have strong encouragement. <clears throat> So we see that the Lord uh, is bodily, uh, the image of God. We've seen that the Lord created everything for himself. Now we see that he has ultimate authority over all things. That makes sense, doesn't it? If he made us and he holds us in his hands, he's got authority over us. It tells us in the other part of our passage in chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, sorry, in verse 10, he is the head of over all rule and authority. It also tells us that he is before all things. Yes, he came before in time, but he is also in position before all things. He is before all rule and authority and head over it. So the Lord has all authority doesn't he say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so no spiritual power, or earthly power, Putin, for example, none of them can do anything, can lift a finger without the Lord allowing them, and, and perhaps you could say giving them the authority to do certain things. The Lord raises up leaders and he brings them down. The Lord allows spiritual powers to have a certain reign, and sometimes, in response to our prayers, he brings them down and he removes their authority over a situation. It's not automatic, but he is willing to do that at times when we pray. So the Lord is head over all rule and authority. But it takes it further. It says he is head over the body, the church. He's head over us anyway because we're created beings. But specifically within the church, you and I are under the headship, the lordship of the Lord Jesus. He has a double claim on us therefore, doesn't he? He has a claim on our obedience because he made us. And he has a claim on our obedience because he's bought us and made us part of his body. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18... Paul says, flee immorality. And he goes on to give a reason for that. Because in verse 19 he said, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. 
Therefore glorify God in your body. He has bought us. He is our head. Now if you turn with me to Ephesians, there are a few passages that talk about these, this idea of the Lord being head of the church. For time's sake, we won't uh, spend long in them, but just so that we can see them. First of all, in Ephesians 1, in verse 21, it talks about how the Lord Jesus has been placed far above all rule and authority. But then in verse 22, it says, He put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Head over all things. That means in every aspect of church life, as well as our own lives as believers, he is head. It means we daren't try to act in our own wisdom. It means we daren't try to act in our own strength, individually or as a body. He is our head over all things. That's the position God the Father has given him. And we need to recognise that, don't we, as believers? Then in Ephesians 5, if you turn over to there, it talks about husbands and wives. And it asks uh, wives to be subject to their husbands in verse 22. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. And the next verse says that wives ought to be to their husbands subject in everything. The implication there is the church is to be subject to Christ. In everything, no aspect left, not under his headship. Fortunately for us with the Lord and for wives with husbands, uh, if husbands fulfil their part of the bargain, it goes on to say, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And it goes on to say that the Lord nourishes and cherishes his body, that's you and me, just as um, anybody would nourish their own flesh. So we can be encouraged that we're not putting ourselves under the headship of a dictator. Mm. Though, if he was a dictator, we'd still need to place ourselves under his headship because he deserves it anyway. But praise the Lord, he's not like that. He is one who gave himself up for her. If you give yourself up into the hands of one who already gave himself up for you, you're in a very happy place. You're in a very safe place. You're not giving yourself up to a selfish person. And that's why if Christian marriages truly reflect this, wives have nothing to fear from submission because they're submitting to someone who has given themselves up for, to them. Sadly, very often, well, actually, in all marriages, let's be honest, in all marriages, none of us can be perfect in this. But even if one side doesn't hold up the, their side of the bargain, we are called to hold the paths uh, and to be something of a reflection of the relationship between Christ, the head, and the church, his body. And the other passage in Ephesians is in Ephesians 4, and verse 15, where it tells us we are to speak the truth in love and to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So we are called to grow up into our head. We're not meant to be kind of, uh, well we are inferior to the Lord in every way of course and we always will be. But we're not meant to be distant from him, where he is up here in stature and we are somewhere down here. He wants us to grow up into him and to take on more and more of his character. If that seems like a tall order to you, praise the Lord that back in our passage in chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, in him you have been made complete. In one sense, the Lord has already done it. He's already at least made it possible. He's already given us everything for life and godliness. And he just wants us to come more into it. So he is head and uh, has authority over all things. 
The last thing that it tells us, which we're not really going to dwell on now for time, and because really we'll cover it more next time, is that he's reconciled everything to himself. Not only did the Lord create everything, and not only has he got authority over everything, but he wants to reconcile everything to himself. Many won't take up that offer, but he wants to he wants to reconcile everything. And notice it says all things in heaven and on earth. I wish I could do justice to that. Um, I think it's something for us to ponder on. Certainly those uh, who are already in heaven, uh, there, and those who died before the Lord, they were ultimately, that reconciliation was worked at, um, at the time of the Lord Jesus' death. But there's also the idea of the wider picture of creation. In Romans 8, it talks about creation being subjected to futility and hoping and longing and groaning to be set free from its slavery into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The whole of creation is going to be touched when the Lord returns and puts everything right. The Lord wants to reconcile all things in heaven and earth to himself. The lion will lie down with the lamb. That's one of the things that we can look forward to. Uh, I'm not suggesting that this is a full explanation of this idea, but I just put these things forward for our consideration of what that might mean. But to finish, two very quick applications for us. As we've seen these things about the Lord, what should it mean for us, apart from just generally worshipping the Lord? Well, the first thing is that he deserves first place in everything, in our lives. In our passage it tells us that he is to come to have first place in everything. He has the status of having first place, but in reality he needs first place. So for you and I, how much does the Lord have first place in our lives? We were made for him. We were told, we read earlier, that he has bought us with a price and we're not our own. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says, Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Our chief end is to glorify God. And the Lord Jesus tells a parable in Luke 17 of servants coming in from the field. And he says, when they come in, their master doesn't say, Oh, put your feet up, you know to put it one way. No, he says, serve me first, and then afterwards, make yourself a meal. And then he says, he doesn't thank them for it, because that's their duty. Now, praise the Lord, the Lord also speaks elsewhere about serving us and ministering to us, amazingly. But there's the picture here that the Lord has first place as our master, our saviour and our Lord. So what about our time? Does he have first place over our time? Some of us have very little time and it's very precious to us because we're very, very busy. Some of us, although busy, really have a lot of time because perhaps you don't have the pressures that others have. Well, whether we have lots or little time, has he got first place over it? Does he have first claim? If we have some spare time and we think, what should I do with it? If the Lord is calling us to do something, does he get first place? What about our money? Does he have first place over how we spend it? We're called to give at least some of our money to the Lord, but with the rest of it, in the decision we make about how to spend or save it, does he have first place? What about our priorities, what we think is most important? What about our plans? Don't think that in the very minutiae of our plans, in what cereal we have for breakfast, I don't think the Lord is looking to have first place in the decision of that. But in so much of our plans, do we refer to the Lord? Sometimes I look back on a week and I realise, you know, I didn't pray about that situation. I made that decision without referring to him. Maybe if I'd prayed about it, he would have said, actually, as first place in your life, I've got something else for you to decide there. But for me, when I do pray, praise the Lord, uh, he is willing to guide and he's true for you. Uh, as well. But ultimately, does he have first place in our heart? Not just in what we do and what we say, but in what we, what our attitude is to the Lord. 
Does he have first place, first affection? And if he doesn't, well, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to work that in us. So he deserves first place in everything. But last application, he holds your life together. We've seen that he holds everything together in creation, but that means he holds your life as well. Underneath the whole creation are the everlasting arms. Underneath your life and mine are the everlasting arms. Do you know there's a phrase in the world, they sometimes say, keep it together. Maybe if you're about to start crying or if you're about to give up or whatever, and they say, oh, you know, keep it together. No. You and I can't keep it together. However strong you feel, however confident I might feel, we can't hold our life together. We can't hold our situations together. We can't hold our problems in check. Only the Lord can do that. And the, Paul, the Apostle Paul had to realise that. He said at the start of 2 Corinthians, they went through a situation in Asia where the affliction was so great... They were, it was beyond their strength and they despaired even of life. And they said what we learn from that is to put our trust in the one who raises the dead, who delivers us. That is what we're called to do, to put our trust in the one who holds all things in our hands. Let me finish by giving an example. It's a worldwide example, but it applies to our lives as well. And the example is World War II. If you think about what it must have felt like to live through those times uh, and how it must have seemed like such a mess with defeats everywhere uh, for a long period of time, with death and suffering and the Holocaust, which people didn't know fully was going on at the time and they knew something of it. There was so much that seemed to be going wrong. You could have lived in that point and said, it's all going to pot. But what did the Lord bring from that? He brought about a great final victory that perhaps people at the time previously couldn't have imagined. The power of Germany and Japan and the spiritual powers behind them were dealt with properly. Our nation at least briefly turned back to God and the churches were filled with prayer days and then thanksgiving days. Prayer generally was revived and the nation of Israel returned to the land. All of that, God worked from apparent chaos. So if your life feels like World War II right now, maybe it doesn't, maybe that's an exaggeration, but if it feels like it, where everything is going wrong, everything is exploding, everything is feel like, feeling like defeat, everything's feeling like setbacks, or if it's just a bit like that, don't worry. God holds your life in his hand. He holds all the pieces that seem perhaps so broken in his hand. And he can put those pieces together. Maybe not how we predict, but into something beautiful. Of course, there was lots of prayer in World War II. God had those big plans. He had everything in hand, but he looked for people to pray. So I'm not suggesting we just don't pray and just trust. We trust and therefore pray. But we trust. So friends, let's give the Lord first place in everything, but let's also be encouraged to trust in the one who holds your life and your situations, your questions, your burdens, your problems in his hand. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to praise and bless you for all that we've considered, and we want to give you glory and honour. We praise you. You are the first in rank, as well as you being the first in time. You and the Father existing before any of us ever came into being. Lord, we give you praise. We say you do have all authority. You have all power over everything and everyone. You have the power to remove our breath in a moment, and we stand in awe at you for that. Lord, we praise and thank you that you hold that power, if we can put it this way, Lord, responsibly, Lord, and mercifully. Lord, you are not a God who is careless or cruel, and we praise you, therefore, that we can trust in you. We praise you that we can trust in you to hold our lives together and hold this world together in mercy and in love. 
certainly in our lives as believers. And Lord, we come and, and ask, please help us to trust in you for those things. Please help us to put you first, to give you first place in all things. Please help us to give you first place in our hearts, where there are other things or people or situations that we give our affections to or our priorities. Please work a change in us. We can't do that ourselves, no more than we can hold our own lives in our own hands. Lord, we look to you, the one with all power. Please work these things in us, we pray. And Lord, as you are the image of the invisible God, please make us as something of the image of you to the world out there. Lord, would you do it, we pray. We bless you and praise you. Amen. Amen.